Say, I was there that day when Hebrews 5 and 6 was exposited, and then it went around the world and set millions of people free. Because these verses that we're about to read have held millions hostage to bondage and have kept the church dull and slow to learn. And when they should be teachers by now, they don't even know what the world's going on. They need to hear the law on steroids so they will run for the perfection of the great high priest. Hebrews 6 verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ. Honestly, check me on this. Going to the Greek, it's not about Christ. It's of Christ. Let us leave the elementary teachings of Christ, the law on steroids, and go on to maturity. Say maturity. I want to tell you, the day you were born again, you were fully matured. You're the full righteousness of God with no room for improvement. The gospel produces fully matured sons of God the instant you're born again. Not laying again and again and again and again. Not laying again. Friends, we have people laying again and again. He says, don't lay it one more time. Kill the whole thing. Blast it out of the way. It's obsolete, redundant. It's gone. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death or dead works and of faith in God, instructions about baptisms, and the laying in of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. Okay, now, five years ago, I believe that he was talking there about the foundations of the new covenant. But over the last period of time, by revelation of God beginning to download understanding and illumination and joining the dots of this new covenant, He's not talking about the foundation elementary teachings of the new covenant after the cross. He's talking about the, the, the elemental milk teachings that make people dull. He's teaching about the, the teachings that make people still need to be taught over and over and over again. And it, without being unkind, folks, if you look at congregations across the planet, you've got people that have been in Christ for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, who are sulking brats. He get easily offended. He was so condemned. He was insecure. He's so jealous. He's so envious. Why? Because we think Hebrews 6, verse 1 and 2, is talking about give them the foundations of the new covenant, the basic milk teachings of the new covenant. No, it's not saying that. And you say, but Rob, faith in God, surely that's a new covenant. No, faith in God under the old covenant is totally different to faith in God. I did the new covenant. So now I'm wrestling through these things and I'm praying and I'm going five days ago. It was about five, six days ago. I'm wrestling. I'm going, dear God, I'm not getting up at a conference and preaching stuff. That's a major departure from the traditions of the church. And then I thought, I felt God say, well, son, you've done it before. You started a few years ago and you started saying things and you thought you were a lone voice. And you heard, I hadn't heard about Joseph Prince and a whole lot of other grace teachers. John, Christ, I hadn't heard about all these guys. Glenda knows that. I had to come to Hong Kong, walk the hills, read my Bible. I just knew something was on my life and God was saying on the runway, sitting in Adelaide, Adelaide in the airport, in the plane, about to take off to come and live in Hong Kong. And God said, son, you've been preaching a mixture of law and grace. You've been preaching a mixture of faith and works and, and flesh and spirit and old and new and Ishmael and Isaac, and Saul and Paul. Mixture. He said, from now on, I want you to preach a pure stream of the new covenant grace, faith, spirit, anointing, life. And I didn't know what he meant. And he began to reveal things. I stood up and started preaching things. And, of course, there was some were delighted and some were not that delighted. And so he says, you've been here before, son. Step out on the water. I said, Lord, give me a sign. <laughs> Lord, confirm this to me. Help me. Before I launch out, Lord, this could go on God channel. Help me. And so the next day I phoned Finney to talk to him and Izzy about the schedule, their schedule, yeah. And Finney wasn't at home and Izzy was there. And I said, hi, Izzy, we had a great chat and I talked about the schedule. And she said, look, I'm just preparing a basic foundation course for new believers or people who have been in Christ for a while, but they haven't got, you know, understanding. And she said, I went to Hebrews 6, verse 1, 
to go through the foundation teachings, and I was starting to prepare. And she said, God spoke to me and said, these are not new covenant elemental truths. These are old covenant elemental truths. I kissed Izzy through the phone. I said, yay! I said, yes! And I just thought, I'm going to preach this at glory and grace. Every now and again, I thought, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't. I, I, I'm so happy sitting there and letting everyone else preach. I love it. So I want to show you, okay, repentance that leads to death or repentance that leads, repentance from dead works. If you look in your marginal reference, in most Bibles, you'll see repentance from dead ceremonies and rituals or repentance from wor dead works is doing things to earn God's favor doing things over and over again to try and get God to love you. The question under the law was always, Lord, am I pleasing enough to you? The question under our high priest who represents us is, Father, is Jesus pleasing enough to you? And the answer is obviously, yes, then we're okay because we are in Him. So repentance from dead works is literally trying to do good things to get a result of God liking you and loving you. So we're not to be living our lives in repentance all the time. Oh, I did that. I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I did that. We're not living in this constant state. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so guilty. That's old covenant. Then what about faith in God? I want to say to you right now that the faith in God of the old covenant is utterly different in many ways to the faith in God, in the new covenant. All right? Oh, come on now, Rob. Okay, quickly, let's just go to Hebrews chapter 11. How many know Hebrews 11 is about the great men and women of faith under the old covenant? Can you say amen? They were great men and women of faith. They did great things with their faith. All right? Let's have a look in Hebrews 11, and let's look at verse 39. These were all commended for their faith, yet none, yet none, Yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. There's that word again, perfect. So all these great men and women of faith did not receive what was promised. They had faith to do all kinds of things, but their faith could not receive what was promised. What does God require? Perfection. And their faith could not receive perfection. And so only through us, the new covenant people, together with us, can they be perfected. So the next chapter goes on and says, so we've got this great cloud of witnesses around us. So we're thinking, oh my God, all these great men and women of faith looking at me and saying, ah, oh, where's your faith? Where's your faith? And we feel so inferior and the, and because we don't exegete the scripture properly. They're not looking at us saying, where your faith? They're going, wow, look at the new covenant faith. They're perfect. They're looking from the realm of the glory, waiting for us so they can have their status and receive the promise that we have already received. So there's no place for arrogance, but hey, Moses, you thought you were good. <laughs> I got something that you never got. I got New Testament faith. I'm going to go lay that old covenant foundation of faith in God again, because that's going to keep people dull, slow to learn. And then he goes and he says, so, you know, this great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off every weight or every hindrance. And I've heard a thousand speculations as to what it is that hinders us. It's, it's that habit. It's that sin. It's that weight. That's who got to get rid of that. No, read the Bible in context. He spent 10 chapters, 11 chapters, talk, talking about how useless, what a hindrance the law religious system is. He's saying, man, they couldn't obtain it through that system. You got something better. You've obtained perfection in Christ Jesus. Throw off what they had that hindered them and don't carry on your back the weight that couldn't get these people of faith to where you've got in Christ Jesus in the new covenant. 
crazy stuff. We take these scriptures out of context, and then everyone, yeah, I've got a hindrance. I've got this habit. I've, I've, got, I've got into a bad pattern. It's hindering me. Friends, that is not what's hindering you. It's that very condemnation of the law. That's hindering you. Now, we're not encouraging sin, but when you're hindered, you're probably going to sin a whole lot more. And then he says, and the sin that so easily overtakes you. Now, he's just given a whole chapter on faith, a whole book on faith. They did not enter because of faith. What is the sin he's talking about? It's not generic sin. It's specific sin. It's the sin of unbelief in the goodness of God, in the goodness of a high priest. And then he's going to say, listen, stop trying to have faith. Put all that blooming old stuff from the old covenant, weights and laws and unbelief. Put it all off now. And run with patience. Hallelujah. Yoo-hoo-hoo. Not looking to have faith. Not trying to have faith. Looking to Jesus, the author and the perfect. There's that word again. The perfecter of faith. Now the NRV says our faith, but that's not in the original Greek. To Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. So we've got a high priest who authors our faith. You didn't author your faith. Your high priest is the author of your, he's the originator and the perfecter because you need perfect faith to be perfectly saved. Because some of you, I don't know if I've got enough faith. Am I really saved? I don't know if I've got enough faith. No, there's someone who's called your high priest that represents you on all matters relating to God. And he has got perfect faith and he's the perfecter of faith and the author of faith and he's your high priest. So you've got perfect faith before a perfect God and you're perfect in your high priest. Shalom Azabandi. Let's read it quickly. Therefore, since verse 1, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of, of our faith, but it should be of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Old covenant faith is me trying to please God. New covenant faith is something God gives to me, something Jesus has on my behalf. Jesus has faith for you, and he has faith in you. Jesus has faith in you. Do you know that a high priest is better than the old covenant high priest that failed? Yet they dealt gently with those who were ignorant and went astray. This perfect high priest is very touched with the feelings of your infirmities. And he sympathizes with you. And he has faith for you. But listen to me, friends. He has faith in you. I want to say something very profound now. That's life-changing. Your life is not primarily or essentially changed by who you believe in. Your life is primarily and essentially changed by who believes in you. The most powerful influence over your life is not who you believe in. The most powerful influence on your life is in who believes in you. Our great high priest has faith in you, and he's got faith for you, And he's the author of faith, and he's the perfecter of faith as the perfect high priest who's made you perfect forever. I don't say it often, but Selah, think about that. When you know somebody believes in you, when you know someone believes in you, it has such a powerful positive effect on your life. You know, everyone in this room has many natural gifts and talents. Not, forget about the supernatural for a moment. Many natural gifts and talents. But most people do not exercise them in fullness unless someone you love and respect believes in you and lets you know that whether it be a mother or dad or a mentor or a brother or a sister or a husband or a wife or a friend. Now imagine just take away the old covenant law and all the bondage and condemnation and see this great high priest 
who believes in you and a father who believes in you and the Holy Spirit who believes in you. Can you imagine revelation on that, the supernatural power that would be released into your life? Do you know that when someone recognizes you, it empowers you? Do you know that if you went to a great celebrity concert and whoever your celebrity is was performing on the concert with 20,000 people there and they stopped in the middle of the concert and said, oh, there's so-and-so. They're a great blessing to my life. They w- and you would just feel 1,000 feet tall because someone is important has recognized you. Friends, it's not the lesser recognizing the greater. It's when the greater recognize the lesser that the power of the supernatural of the new covenant takes place. The old covenant had great emphasis on faith in God. The new covenant's emphasis is on God's faith in you, His faith for you. The old covenant lays the burden on you to have faith in God. The new covenant lays the burden on our great high priest to have faith and perfect faith on our behalf. So that you're not examining yourself all the time to see if you have faith, but your eyes are on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. It takes all the pressure off self-focus. You're not trying to have faith anymore. It's not your concern anymore. No, my focus is on the revelation of Christ, and in Him I was crucified. He did it because He loved me and gave Himself for me. I'm crucified with Him, and the life I live, yet not I, but I live, yet not I, but the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Before the cross, the flow of faith was from God to us. Before the cross, the flow of faith was us to God. After the cross, the flow of faith was God to us to us. When someone asks you, do you believe in Jesus? You say, well, let me tell you something. I know one thing. He believes in me. And I'm not insecure about whether I have enough faith in Him. I am very secure. He has enough faith perfected for me. If you ask me, do I believe in Jesus? I say, absolutely. How much do you believe in Him? It's not the issue. And I don't want to probe or analyze or introspect that. I just want to keep looking at his lovely face. I want to keep looking at what he did at the cross because that releases his faith and confidence in me. Your life is not stabilized by you trying to have faith. Your life is stabilized by the revelation of how much faith he has in you and for you. You see, the high priest has to have faith for you. Guys, is this good news or is it good news? The power of the kingdom is not rooted in man's faith in God. That's old covenant elemental milk teaching. That's keeping the church dull. The power of this kingdom is rooted in God's faith in you. He believes in you. His faith in you is not a blind faith. He's not pretending. It's not a blind faith. He invested everything at the cross for you so that now his opinion of you is one of integrity. He sees you not as one trying to be holy, not trying to be righteous, not trying to be sanctified, not trying to be redeemed. He sees you as you are. You are acknowledged by God because of the perfection of your great high priest. Yes, God says to us, yes, I know, I know who you are, and I know not only who you are, but I know what you are, through, I know everything I've made you to be through the cross. I want you just to say for a moment, the high priest acknowledges me. It's, it's, not a, it's not some celebrity. It's not some guru who's calling you out from thousands. It's the great high priest, the word of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth is with deep love and kindness acknowledging you. I've got faith in you. I've got a new covenant that makes you superior to any kind of faith all the men and women of the old covenant had, including Abraham. (laughs) Jesus never came to be your example. He never came to be your standard to live up to. He became your substitute to measure up for you. 